days, we rarely, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> these days we rarely hear <coughs> from the left in the United States. I gotta clear it. <coughs> the mainstream media tells us that Barack Obama is a leftist. They never bother to correct politicians who label social security as socialism. Whether it's news reporting or even the so-called leftist MSNBC, there's an absolute void of voices of people who do any of capitalism <laughs> or people who mention the words working class or those who advocate for socialism. If you want to hear those voices, you have to find it in the alternative media something the vast majority of people don't find. Nor do our children in public schools and universities learn about labor and social movements, except as occasional oddities from the past. The idea of teaching them how to exercise their rights as workers and as citizens beyond voting, let alone how to organize and build social movements, is almost entirely absent in our educational system. Many of us have heard of masterful organizers and strategists from the past who were on the side of working people. You've heard of Eugene Debs, or Mother Jones, or Saul Alinsky, or Cesar Chavez, or Martin Luther King, but we don't hear about such people who are working and organizing today. Our speaker, Eric Mann, is a master organizer and strategist, and a leftist, who openly advocates for socialism. He's written a new book called Playbook for Progressives, 16 Qualities of the Successful Organizer. Mike Davis calls it an art of war for organizers around the world. In it, Eric draws from many tough battles he's taken on and won, and from the experience of many organizers and strategists he's met and worked with. It's filled with great stories about successful organizers and the theory of how they won. We need more organizers. Buy this book and read it. It's a noble profession. I met Eric in person for the first time last fall in St. Louis at a conference dedicated to the memory of a great radical labor leader, Jerry Tucker. But I felt I already knew him because I'd read a couple of his books. I knew Eric as a movement builder because of a video I've used numerous times in my classes to teach students about building broad working class coalitions. It's called Tiger by the Tail, and it's about the movement of auto workers in Los Angeles that forced General Motors to keep its Van Nuys assembly plant open almost a decade after the auto industry decided to abandon the West Coast. Workers, community residents, faith leaders, labor leaders, including Cesar Chavez, Jesse Jackson, and state reps, all threatened a boycott of GM car sales in Los Angeles and brought GM to negotiate and to keep the plant open. The movement kept good paying industrial jobs in LA long after they were supposed to leave, while factories across the country were shutting down. Eric Mann learned from the best starting in the civil rights movement in the 1960s, organizing against racism in the North for, for the Congress of uh, Racial Equality. He was in SDS and in the movement against the Vietnam War, the Soldad Brothers and Attica Defense Committees. He joined the United Auto Workers in the 1980s and 25 years ago, founded and became director of the Labor Community Strategy Center in Los Angeles, which founded the Bus Riders Union, an amazing and large community organization that has for forced the Los Angeles Metro Transportation Authority to significantly reorder its priorities and serve the needs of poor people who depend on it and who breathe the air. Eric's written six books, including Comrade George, about George Jackson, Taking on General Motors, LA's Lethal Air, and 
the 2004 elections and Katrina's legacy. Eric's also the host of a weekly radio show, Voices from the Front Lines, on KPFK, the Los Angeles Pacifica affiliate, which is a sister station of our own KKFI. He's written more than 200 articles, and they've appeared in places like the New York Times, the LA Times, the Socialist Register, Black Commentator, and The Nation. Currently, Eric has embarked on his most radical venture, which he calls the fight for the soul of the cities. It's audacious and comprehensive in its approach, which turns on its head what so many of us think about organizing for social change. That is, pushing for achievable, achievable demands, which we go after one demand at a time. As you can see from this slide, they're going after the whole thing. It addresses a very new way of what Eric has said is the fundamental challenge today. A full employment economy, jobs are income now based on ecological imperatives versus capitalism's inability and unwillingness to provide them. That's what he's going to talk about tonight. Eric will talk and then we'll take questions. And after that, he'll sign copies of his book if you choose to buy one. The book is Playbook for Progressives. And with that, it's a great honor to welcome Eric Mann. So hi, it's really great to be here. And uh, you know, come to Kansas City, Kansas City, here I come. Come to Kansas City, Kansas City, here I come. They got some really good organizers and I'm gonna meet me some. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I got, I've always actually wanted to come here and uh, it started about a year ago when um, uh, Judy Ansel actually asked me if I was interested in coming to Kansas City and that Henry Fortunato from the library was interested in having me. And I said I was interested in doing that. And then at the Jerry Tucker conference, I met Ashley Beard Fosno, who encouraged me to come. And I like to work with a lot of young organizers. And then I got uh, a strange e email. Dina, are you here? No, oh, hi, Dina. So I got this email based on um, the invitation that went out. Uh, from Dina Strum Klein, who was my long lost partner at a Howard Zinn meditation retreat that we went to five years ago. But the email said, I'm going to come to Kansas City when I finish my book. And I hadn't even started the book yet. So it was one of those very weird uh, prophetic introductions. So for all of you who helped me get here, cosmically and materially, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm excited to be here. Beautiful library, by the way. This is a very cool place, and it's, it's fun to be here. Um, what I want to talk to you about is, is revolution, the need for one, the possibility of one, the attractiveness of one, and the fact that you should all be involved in helping us make it. Um, so let's start with a couple of things. So I'm going to give some introduction. But right now, if you got this flyer, and we purposely put this flyer out in Los Angeles just like this. So Fight for the Soul of the Cities, powered by the Labor Community Strategy Center, the Bus Riders Union, and the Community Rights Union. No cars, no A. Free public transportation. Free the US 2.5 million prisoners. 5,000 zero emission buses and 24 7 service, amnesty and open borders for immigrants, stop US drone attacks, and fight for the right to protest and organize. Now, if I came to Kansas City and said that we wanted to form a chapter of Fight for the Soul of the Cities or encourage you to set something like that up, before you knew anything more, and it's okay to say, how many people think? Yeah, I'm interested in that. 
if you'd raise your hand. How many people think I'm interested, but there's a couple of things on there that I don't know where you're coming from, but let's discuss it. <laughs> okay. And how many people are thinking, you got to be kidding? <laughs> okay. So, uh, let's see. I'm going to go to the next uh, slide. Right now in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles MTA is going to try to raise the bus fare again and again and again. And one of the things happening in this country, I think you know, is that during the 30s, especially when the Communist Party was strong, when the left was strong, the concept of the social wage was developed. And the social wage said that you don't just get a wage from your employer, but there's a total social wage. And, and actually, Franklin Delano Roosevelt talked about that. He talked about the public welfare, which given racism today has now been called welfare. And what a screwed up country that the concept of welfare is considered a bad word. Right. Because of course it's identified with black folks. So anything involving black folks in this country is turned on its head. You could say free money, but if it was with black people, they'd say, I don't want anything to do with that, a lot of the white people, you know? Right. So we are going to try to build a movement, and we met with the mayor of Los Angeles. Now, one of the things I think in your stereotypes is, well, this is really good, <clears throat> but you know, I'm trying to be a really practical person. I know how to work with the mayor, and I know how to work with the city council. In fact, I've just met with the mayor's third deputy assistant associate just <laughs> yesterday, and he told me he's quite generally interested in perhaps what we said, and <laughs> it shows the clout I have, boy, I'm really, <laughs> see, I'm not like those leftists who's isolated. I got inside cachet. So we just met with um, Mayor Eric Garcetti. And I have to admit, that was a big thing for us. So this is the letter that we sent him. These are the demands that we sat down and talked to him about, which elaborates, first we took the demand, right, no cars, no way. Now I'm gonna sort of elaborate the no cars in LA piece. Restrict auto use, bus only lanes on surface streets and freeways, auto free rush hours, auto free days, auto free zones. Stop the US and LA's attack on the planet. Stop LA's attack on our public health. Stop the auto's attack on our public health. No fare, stop any MTA fare increases. No fare free public transportation. No fair free student bus passes. No fair stop the MTA sheriff stop and frisk on buses and trains. In Los Angeles, they are actually arresting people who don't pay their fare. And of course, this is mainly, again, young and black, black and Latino youth. Restore one million hours of bus service at the Bus Riders Union won during our 10-year civil rights consent decree that the MTA cut as soon as federal oversight was lifted. Purchase 5,000 zero emission buses for a total fleet of 7,500 zero emission, no fare buses running 24 seven. Stop the great, great train robbery, a moratorium on all new rail projects. We can use the existing rail lines as part of a bus centered multimodal system, but no mass, no more. A moratorium on highway expansion, Stop the MTA as a gentrification developer. Stop the MTA attacks on transit riders who speak at MTA meetings. A code of conduct for the MTA board demanding rights and respect for transit riders at all public forums. How many people are interested in that? Now, what's interesting is that this comes out of a long revolutionary tradition. This is work, as Judy Ansel said, that's in some way an expansion of my own consciousness and even a self-criticism of work that I think we should have been done at the Strategy Center maybe at least five or six years ago. But it took a while because we actually had to build a base in Los Angeles. And one of the things I like about my own life is I talk about what I really do. I'm an architect who talks about buildings I've built. I don't talk about what you should build. 
I don't critique other people's buildings. I just mainly build my own buildings and say, this is my theory, this is my practice. And if the building is real small, I tend to talk small because I think big, but our work has to grow and occupy the size of the theory that we claim is right. So I can imagine that I get up in the middle of the night worried and concerned about where the work is going and is it really living up to our expectations. So there's a, a long tradition that begins, uh, Manuel Criollo and I have a, he's the director of organizing. When we teach classes, we, you know, I'll say, well, you have to start, you know, you can't understand this until the slave rebellions of 1865. And I'll say, no, actually, you can't understand it until you understand um, uh, Columbus's invasion in 1492. And I said, well, no, actually, you can't understand it until you go back to the indigenous people who first came to the United States. But the point is that you can't understand where we are without understanding ourselves in a continuity of the human experience that goes hundreds of thousands of years that unfortunately our generation is very close to destroying for all future humanity. So there's a tremendous burden and a tremendous opportunity here, which I'm going to talk about. Aha! So this is our 25th anniversary party happening in Los Angeles at the Wilton Theater, which is one of the coolest theaters in Los Angeles. We have a building right next to it. It's an Art Deco building, a beautiful green building with 12 floors. And we're on the top floor. We're on the revolutionary penthouse. And I remember when most of our members, by the way, are black and Latino. And I remember when a lot of our members first came to the office, they said, for once, we're on the top. For once, we're looking down at them. So we're in a very good vantage point in LA. But the Wilton Theater is a very famous theater. It's beautiful Art Deco. It's like gazillion feet tall, and it's, we have 500 people coming from all over the country, and we need a couple of you to come. Or rather, I offer you the opportunity to come, because we really have people coming from all over the country, and this will be a June 21st. I'm going to be talking to you about coming after I try to convince you to buy 100 of these books. <laughs> so, We're going to start in one tradition here. I mean, while we could go back forever, I'm going to talk about, um, you know, this book called, I mean, this song called Solidarity Forever. <clears throat> so, uh, when the union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there shall be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one, but the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever, for the union makes us strong. Now I'm going to skip to this. It is we who plowed the prairies, built the cities where they trade, dug the mines and built the workshops, endless mile railroad laid. Now we stand outcast and starving. It's the wonders we have made, but the union makes us strong. They have taken untold millions that they never taught to earn, but without our brain and muscle, not a single wheel can turn. We can break their haughty power, gain our freedom when we learn that the union makes us strong. In our hands is placed a power greater than the hoarded gold, greater than the might of armies magnified a thousandfold. We can bring to birth a new world from the ashes of the old, for the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Come on. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. 
Now, now, one of the things when you look at this is, this is sung today in a lot of union halls, but the unions today are not speaking in this language too often. It is we who plowed the prairies and we built the cities, because the fight for the soul of the cities is the cities in the United States have been built by working people, but designed by the ruling class. The ruling class plans Paris, they plan Rome, the working class builds it, then the working class is considered a market, and then when the working class is useless, in their eyes, they become prisoners. So now we're locking up the working class, especially the black and Latino working class. They have taken untold millions that they never toiled to earn, et cetera. In our hands is placed a power greater than their hoarded gold. But today, the unions are talking about we want a middle class standard of living. They're talking about we love America, and that America has really let us down because it's the land of the free and the home of the brave. Whereas I come from the tradition of uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, who said the United States is the land of the thief and the home of the slave. So I come from a different tradition. And the question that, the reason why Du Bois said the land of the thief and the home of the slave, or if you've read um, Frederick Douglass's What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, is it's a totally different vision of this country. It's also US history, but it's a black driven history, a slave driven history that would put us in co conjunction with the people of the third world. It's an internationalist history, and that's the history that I became part of. That's the revolution I joined in 1964. So in 1964, when I worked with the Congress of Racial Equality, you know, we sang, um, hold on, let me get some water. Go. We shall overcome, um, I know that. We shall overcome, I know that. We shall overcome someday. Oh, gee, in my heart, I know that. I do believe, whoa, 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 we shall overcome someday. See, SNCC had a lot of soul. So, and I joined the movement because it was the sexiest thing going. See, I mean, like if you see the Wolf of Wall Street today and you see Leonardo DiCaprio, you know, uh, snorting coke, taking quaaludes, and that's supposed to be sexy, that he uh, cheats people on the phone and they all laugh, then they all have an orgy on the plane. That was the most sexless orgy I've ever seen, if you've seen the film. It's like, there was, I mean, I was waiting for the orgy scene. These capitalists can't even good or run a good orgy scene anymore, you know? It was like, it was like so bad. It's like, uh, so I joined the movement because it was the coolest thing to be. It was a place where you made your choices. I was asked when I joined the movement, are you willing to put your body on the line? Are you willing to make a lifetime commitment? Are you willing to risk your life? And as I said, boy, this is a hell of an opening appeal. I mean, I'm just an intern. <laughs> but the reality is that that's what was being asked. Because Mickey Schwerner and Andy Goodman and James Cheney and Medgar Evers, and so many others had already given their lives. John Lewis, who's now in Congress, was badly beaten within an inch of his life. So this wasn't abstract. If you want to join this movement, you make choices. You make moral choices. And I'm saying today that the labor movement has lost its sense of ethics and morality and, and has been tripped, tricked into a narrow, instrumentalism about wages, hours, and working conditions. And let me ask you a question. If everybody is really just thinking about wages, hours, and working conditions, then why are there one billion people in the Catholic Church? Because it's a, it's a cause. And I joined the revolution that was a cause. Of course we wanted 
sandwiches at Woolworths. We wanted better jobs for black people. And I helped to get better jobs for black and Latino people at the Trailways Bus Company where I organized a movement of, but I worked with real porters. Eddie Barnes was the first porter I ever worked with, a black porter who came to me when I was working at CORE and said, I need your help. And I said, Eddie, what's the problem? He said, I was discriminated against by the Trailways Bus Company. And I said, Eddie, with all due respect, we don't take individual cases. He says, individual my ass. I got 15 porters, black and Puerto Rican porters, ready to turn trailways upside down. I said, I'll be right over. So me and Eddie hooked up, and we built this movement, and we organized um, boycotts of trailways in every single, uh, the Port Authority Terminal in New York, in DC, and, and so forth. And within a year, trailways caved. And in terms of revolutions, you can't imagine the revolution of seeing a brilliant black man, Eddie, who had been told, by the way, that he failed the test for bus drivers. And he subpoenaed it, because he was one smart guy. And he found out that he got one of the highest scores in the history of the company. Imagine the pain of black people being told that you're intellectually inferior, only to find out, of course, that you're not that you aced the exam, but they lied to you because they want to keep you as a porter. So when I came back to the Port Authority a year later, and there was Eddie selling tickets, and there was Big Joe driving a bus, and there was no, no uh, Quinones um, as an information clerk, and I saw all these black and Puerto Rican people working, I said, you know, I saw a revolution with my own eyes. We went from segregation to integration, and it can happen. Then, um, we built the movement against the war in Vietnam. And, um, <coughs> sorry. So we built, <coughs> built the movement against the war in Vietnam. And, um, trying to think of the next song. See where I'm going. Uh, Woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind, with my mind, yeah, set on freedom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Everybody gotta walk, walk. You gotta talk, talk. You gotta walk, walk. Go with your minds on freedom. Gotta walk, walk. You gotta talk, talk. You gotta walk, walk. Go with your minds on freedom. Ooh, hallelujah. So then, so then I went to the March on Washington, and this was the March on Washington against the war in Vietnam in 1965, organized by SCS. And there was Robert Moses speaking there from SNCC. And he said, we have to build a connection between the murders in Mississippi and the napalm in Vietnam. And I said, yes, of course. So what people don't know is the white kids were great on the war in Vietnam, but people don't understand that it was SNCC's, hell no, we won't go. It was Muhammad Ali's, the most powerful agitational slogan in the history of the world is no Viet Cong ever called me the N-word. In that one sentence, every black person in the world understood, whether they agreed or not, why in the hell are we fighting over in Vietnam? And people don't realize that he risked not just his championship, he had a five-year prison sentence that was given to him for defying the draft, even though he was a conscientious objector as a member of the Nation of Islam. Today, he would be in prison for 25 years for verbal terrorism. And they're making up these terrorism, by the way. You know, there's a new concept they have called nonviolent terrorism. Think about it. These people don't care. You know, there's an old uh, joke in the movement these people are on a demonstration, you know. This is about people in the movement today who think they can get out from under the police state by making themselves more um, 
saleable. So my favorite joke is that, you know, during the 30s, this guy is marching in, the, in, a, in a picket line, and the cop comes over and says, you damn communist, you damn communist. And he says, sir, you got it totally wrong. I'm an anti-communist. He says, I don't care what kind of communist you are. You know, <laughs> starts beating him up. So the point is, is that you can run, but you can't hide from the police state. So let's go back to LA. Um, let's see. So what we're trying to do is build a movement in Los Angeles rooted in the black and Latino community, reaching out to people of all races, all classes. And we believe that at this point in history, there's a revolutionary program that's rooted in real things. That's to say, I am, as Judy said, I'm both an anti-imperialist and a socialist. I'm also a black nationalist because I come out of that tradition. But we don't debate those as much. We don't say to people, do you want to discuss black nationalism or socialism or communism? Not to say that we won't, won't have the conversation, but the real issue is what do you want to do today? Let's discuss what do we really want to do today because our ideology exists within our choices. The generality is re reflected inside the particular. So let's talk about no cars in LA. Um, The global warming crisis is moving at such a severe pace that my wife, Leanne, is, is uh, studying this for the Strategy Center you know, full time. And the stuff is changing every five days now. The rapidity of the scientific understanding of climate change, and every time, the story is it's coming faster. It's moving at an exponential rate. And it's a, it's a, it's a product of industrial society, it's a product of capitalism and also state socialism that believed that the planet was there to be exploited. So state socialism in, in theory for the betterment of everybody, capitalism for the better of the few, but both theories, unfortunately, saw the earth as something to be taken and distributed among humans. And there is more of the indigenous socialism that said we have an organic relationship, we don't own this planet. We're lucky as hell to be on it. And every piece of the planet has rights. And it's because we have the most ability to destroy it doesn't give us any particular rights. So we're trying to build a movement for no cars in a way, and we mean no cars in a way, to restrict it. Now, imagine me. I was the head of the campaign to keep GM Van Nuys open. Our slogan was more cars in LA. <laughs> and I won. So, and I built the Chevrolet Camaro and the Pontiac Firebird, and I love cars. I love my own car. I drive a, a, a Camry hybrid. It's a cool car. But I'm going to have to give it up. That's the point. It's not just going to be hybrids. We're going to have to go to mass public transportation now. And we're going to have to restrict it because I will, as much as I say I'm going to voluntarily do it, the reality is that society through the government must restrict the use of autos and say, you just can't do it. And it can be done. Free the US 2.5 million prisoners. Judy and I worked on the Soledad case together. And you know, I worked with George Jackson in 1970. In 1970, there were 200,000 prisoners in the United States. And I thought this was the most grotesque thing I'd ever heard of. Today, there's 2.5 million people inside the prisons. 25% of the people in the world are in US prisons, 1 million of whom are black, 500,000 of whom are Latino. And I agree with Paul Robeson and W.B. Du Bois that we have to go to the United Nations and say this is a human rights abuse. So the, the gall of John Kerry, who once had the guts to throw his weapons at the, uh, I mean, his medals at the White House, and is now arguing for war crimes, we have to go to the international arena and ask the United States internationally to free these prisoners. Because over 90% of them have done nothing at all. Right. Not, I mean, nothing. Use of a bottle, uh, possession of marijuana, um, even selling. What does selling mean? You're in a low-income community. You bought three bags, you sold it to the other kid. So the whole idea that, well, we want to cr crack down on the dealers. Anyway, don't get me started there. Then the issue of amnesty and open borders for immigrants. 
Capital believes that it has the right to go wherever it wants. We have 11 million people in this country who are immigrants who are being hounded and terrified by what's happening to them. They can be walking down the street thinking they have a job, have a family, the next thing they don't come home. And they're in an ICE prison because they're not just being deported, they're being imprisoned and you can't even find them for six months. So the idea of saying we need open borders, not Obama's horrible, horrible concession of militarizing the border. And he's called the deporter in chief. And to stop the US drone attacks, because um, there's a lot of things we want to stop in the US military, but the drones are in some way symbolic. In other words, we pick these demands because they open up one of the most profound moral questions, which is, does the United States in fact assassinate millions of people all over the world? Yes, it does. Uh, did the United States assassinate a million young kids in Iraq through the, um, what's it called, the uh, sanctions before they even invaded Iraq? Yes, they did. Is there massive starvation all over the world because of our government? Absolutely. But there's something about the fact that the President of the United States wakes up in the morning and takes out his GPS and says, I think we're going to kill that one in another country, violating the sovereignty of another country, assassinating political leaders, who they now call bad guys, killing, of course, all, a lot of people around them. If we can't get people morally outraged at this, then we have a big problem. But here's the positive, and I'm going to end with this. I think we can. I think people are really have had it. There's a lot of very hopeful things going on. The first thing that's happening is that black and Latino youth who have been so heavily policed are really rising up in some very beautiful ways. They're, they're really, I'm going to work with them. It's pretty exciting to work with 16 and 17 and 18 and you know, I, I love when Carlos, 27, turns to a 17-year-old and says, when I was your age, you know. So we have uh, an organization from 16 to uh, uh, Amelia just died yesterday at 104. And she was very active until six weeks ago. So we have an amazing organization, exists in the real world. And we're putting this out in the city. It's picking up traction. People want to join it. And I think that the fight for the soul of the cities, similar to what happened in New York when Bill de Blasio, who's not a leftist but is a very good guy, he ran on a tale of two cities. And he called the question. The question was, there's a city of the rich and a city of the poor. And he took on stop and frisk. Amazing that. He took on the police and won. Now, he's lucky he had such a great looking son with an afro. That didn't hurt, plus a beautiful wife. You know, but that was an example of the new possibilities in this country. So let me end with, end with a couple of things. Um, my book, uh, Playbook for Progressives, I think everything right now is about asking people to do things. Uh, we have only about 65 or 70 books there. There's, there's a wonderful audience here. I mean that everybody should consider buying two or three books and getting a book and getting it in the hands of other people. It's a simple thing. Because we, we want to end with, the, I always say with the ask. The ask is the reality of what you think. You know, somebody says to you, uh, can I help? Yeah, sure, I can help. Oh, would you loan me $100? Oh, that kind of help? No. So there's got to be some content to the ask. And the ask right now is, would you help us get this book into the hands of other people? The second thing is, will you support all the good causes in Kansas City? Will you work with Jobs with Justice? Will you help the fast food workers? Will you help the extension of the vote, which is very, very important? There's, there's causes right now that need your help. And, uh, and I think the last thing I want to say is that I'm very frightened that a new generation of young people has been fed a lot of anti-communism, and a lot of very bad history about the black movement, that the Black Panthers were thugs and gangsters, that King uh, had a dream, and they don't understand King's evolution into a socialist. They don't understand his Riverside speech. 
They don't understand who Malcolm is. They, they don't understand who Che Guevara is. They don't understand all the great work that was done that gets us to where we are today, including, yes, electing Barack Obama president of the United States. That was a tremendous victory, but unfortunately, it has to be surpassed because the victory was the symbol. He was a terrific symbol. I worked my ass off him, and I'm glad I did. I think there were certain people on the left who said, well, why are you going to work for Obama? He's an imperialist. He's a capitalist. He's a I said, I get it. His name is Barack Hussein Obama, running for president of the United States against John McCain. You don't get the difference? <laughs> you don't get it. I dig that they're both imperialists. But there's one kind, I, this is a big breakthrough for the whole black community. This is a breakthrough against white supremacy. After Obama's elected, we're going to have to have a, a deeper struggle with this man. But I am so proud. And that night when he won, and I saw him and Michelle, you know, my buddies, because I gave them a lot of money. They kept sending me these emails. Eric, hi, Michelle. I said to Leanne, I just gave Michelle some money. She said, it's funny, I just gave Barack some money. So you know how they, perp you know, they made us their friends? So when Michelle and Barack, my buds, were walking down Pennsylvania Avenue, I was crying. And I was proud. I was proud that the people of this country, including a lot of white people, voted for a black president who was perceived to be radical, was perceived to be revolutionary. And that in itself should give us hope that the fact that people saw a, an opportunity for real change and went for it, it's now our job to build a change on the ground. So I'm going to just end with a couple of songs, and then I'm really happy to talk to you. We would end with this song. A lot of you don't know it, and some of you do, called The International. But I have a couple of really revolutionary songs I want to do first that come out of my early traditions. <clears throat> Should open, show be do. In the still, should open, show be of the night. I held you, should open, show, held you tight, should open, show be when I love, I love you so. I promise to never show the and show me that you go show the in the still show the of the night in the still of the night. I re I remember that night. I remember the stars were bright above. I, I remember and I pray to keep your prayer. Just love will be for Jodo and show me love lies. Promise you never with all of your might in the still of the night, in the still of the night <laughs> in the still of the night should and so boom should and so boom should and so boom should and so be whoa Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> so, um, you've all been great, really. And thanks a lot. We're going to sing this song. How many people know the song, The Internationale? Okay. It's a wonderful song. And we sing it at the Labor Community Strategy Center's 25th anniversary. We sing it every year. And we sing it in English, Korean, 
and Spanish, which is pretty cool because we have a lot of Korean members, a lot of um, Latino members. Um, but it's a really wonderful song about hope and about the working class, just like uh, we started with uh, Solidarity Forever, but it's a higher level of theory and practice. So let me see if I can get my voice right. <clears throat> okay, I'll try it here. Arise, ye prisoners of starvation. Arise, ye wretched of the earth. For justice thunders condemnation. A better world's in birth. No more traditions change shall by dust, no more enslaved, no more enthralled. The earth, it's going to march, you know, the earth shall rise on new foundations. We have been all, we have been all. Tis the final conflict. Let it stand in his place. The international working class shall be the human race. Tis the final conflict. Let it stand in her place. The international working class shall be the human race. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, we're really happy about questions and answers. For those of you leaving, please consider buying a book on the way out, and I'd love to hear from you. Mr. Mann, I've been to many presentations uh, here in this library and uh, at other venues, and you're the first presenter that has sung a cappello. I applaud <laughs> your guts and your talent. You got a great pair of pipes, man. My question is, on, the, on the, one of the earlier slides, one of the bullet points talked about stopping uh, building uh, light rail or rail cars uh, in Los Angeles. We here in Kansas City are getting ready to approve or not approve a, a proposal to expand our light rail. Could you uh, talk a little bit about the uh, uh, light rail and uh, bus system dilemma? I sure will, and thanks a lot. You know, I'm very influenced by a group called the Persuasions, by the way, who uh, are an old a cappella group. And um, uh, let me explain about the rail bus situation. <clears throat> um, there's a purpose for rail, but rarely in urban contexts. Rail is phenomenally expensive. It's, in Los Angeles, it's like $150 million or at least a mile for above ground, and, and that's down up to $350 million a mile for subway. The same thoroughfares, if you had bus-only lanes with new buses, brand new zero emission buses, could be running for the same price of one mile of rail, bus doesn't even need to change the structure. Um, there's no construction, which is why the construction unions don't like it and why the, the construction companies don't like it. But who should like it is the public because you can have so many buses running 24-7 on the existing streets we have. But they have to be bus-only lanes because the value of bus is that it can't compete with the car. You have to give the lanes the opportunity to, be, you know, to get preference. Now, in Los Angeles, we didn't at first oppose rail. We just saw, you know, we were bus riders union, we understood it a little bit. But what we came to understand is very quickly that the first rail line from Long Beach to downtown was built at $50 million. That's a lot, but it came in at $400 million. The other thing they do is all the cost overruns that they don't tell you about once, because their attitude is like, once you dig the hole, what are you going to do? They'll say, well, it went over, but I can't close it up now. 
So I would argue to you, and, and I have some publications that I'll go into more detail, that rail is fundamentally a gentrification trick. First of all, people are going to bet on the rail stops. They're going to figure out where the rail stops are. They're going to buy up that property. They're going to jack up the prices. They're going to build condos and luxury stores. They're going to displace the people who live next to the rail stop. And they're, and they're going to say so-called transit-oriented development. But by the time they finish that light rail, you won't be able to afford to live it. So that's, I could have long, you know, I would say this is going to be true in Kansas City without knowing all the details. But you'll look into it yourself. But that's the theory. And it is being discussed like this all over the country. I'd urge you to look into zero emission buses and use that as your first um, line. The second thing is you can have those zero emission buses in a year and a half. And you can put bus drivers, mechanics, maintenance people on it. You could put more service on it. You could use more of your operating money to hire more drivers to, for more green jobs. I think it's a much better move. Go ahead, brother. No, no, no sir, I was up first. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't see. Please. Uh, you know, you had this, uh, this display up with free this and free that and, and, and the unions. This country uh, has a very short memory. Now, I'm retired from corporate employment and uh and i was there when the wages were great and the middle class was great right because we had unions as soon as we got ronald reagan in there and people want to forget about they they say he's great he was the worst president we've ever had in modern days he just <laughs> he destroyed the air traffic controllers union that started all the bad stuff. All the, all of the wages were rolled back. Now we're back 30 years later, and we're in bad shape because of that. But the people in this country, they don't want to see that. They, they want to name a street after him. They want to name an airport after him. And he did us damage beyond repair, it seems, because everyone's, they don't want to acknowledge how badly off we are because of him. My question is, with your unions, what, what, what can we do to wake the people up in this country to see that we have to undo what Reagan did? It's a very good question, and I'm, I'm writing, you know, I, I'm always writing a book, but the, um, I think what you're absolutely right about is 19, you know, when I talk about the two decades of the 60s, it started in 1955 in the Bandung Conference in Indonesia and the Montgomery bus boycott. It ended in 1975 with the defeat of the United States in Vietnam, and it was the high point of the civil rights movement. Jimmy Carter was the transition. He was not a good guy, if you go back and look. He was a Southerner, but you know he was a Southern moderate, like Bill Clinton, if you like those types, which I don't. Um, but he made a lot of concessions. But Reagan was the breakthrough ideologue. He was the one, as you said, who said, I'm going to call it directly. And I would add to you, that he not only broke Patco, you're absolutely right, but he was the one who went after welfare queens. He was the one who racialized so many of the attacks on black people. <clears throat> and one of the sad things is that in this country, the attack on black people has always been the front line of the attack on everybody. Because black people have been on the front line of all the good stuff. Why do you think there's 2.5 million people in prison right now? I would argue it's the counter-revolution against everything that we built. Because black people rebelled in the streets. Black people led Latinos, led whites, led Asians, in the very best sense of led, through their intellectual work. I don't mean, you know, but we were deeply influenced by Malcolm. You ask almost any Latino revolutionary today, any Asian, ever, any, almost any woman, where were some of the first thoughts you had about trans transition and they would say, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer, Malcolm X, uh, Audre Lorde. So your point is absolutely right, that 1980 was, in fact, the turning point of the ideological revolution, which, in fact, Bill Clinton continued. And I have to say, so did Barack Obama. And when Barack Obama says something like, we, we have to take more personal responsibility, I want to take a minute for this. I've lived in the black community for 50 years. I know of no people 
who've taken more responsibility for their lives under the worst condition imaginable with such good spirit and such beautiful love and so many families taking care of each other. To, so to be attacked as if the families living six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 in, into a small apartment are not teaching their kids to read when the kids are late to school sometimes because they're trying to dress their other brothers and sisters, and then they get on the bus, and the bus is late, and then when they get to school, they get a traffic ticket, a truancy ticket from the school. So all the anti-black um, vilification of such a wonderful people has to be central to any revolution that we're going to have. And I think Reagan opened, and, and Barack Obama, And Barack Obama, who I expected more of, is running a post-racial presidency right in the height of the most racist times in U.S. history. There's nothing post-racial, I'm, I'm sorry to say. He's been an empty suit. That's a very good way of saying it, empty. Thank you, my brother. So thank you very much about nailing the PADCO and nailing the 1980. Yes, sir. How much responsibility do you hold individuals to in relation to not knowing about all this history? And how much do you assign to the media, to the mainstream media? In other words, people can go out and learn about all this stuff, but they're not going to get it from the mainstream media for the most part. How much responsibility do you assign to each of those, to the individual, and to the mainstream media for the lack of knowledgeability about all these things? These are all, I want to just say already, these are such thoughtful questions. Um, we have a, a project at the Strategy Center called Fight Menticide, and I want to talk to you about that for a minute. I got the word from Mumia Abu Jamal. I have a radio show that I'd like you to listen to. It's called Voices from the Frontlines. Check it out, it's www.voicesfromfrontlines.com. Uh, in Kansas City, it's on Tuesday night at 6. In New York, it's Tuesday at 7. In LA, it's Tuesday at 4. But we have a beautiful website. And you can download any show you want from the site, any time you want. And go back and see the interview that I did with Mumia Abu-Jamal, uh, who's a prisoner who just got off death row after 30 years, is now in the general population uh, for a crime he didn't commit. So he and I were talking about W.E.B. Du Bois one of my favorite, favorite people. And he was saying, and so every, he and I were getting this conversation about Du Bois, and, and I said, you know, the young kids today, they don't even know who Du Bois is. They don't know who Paul Robeson is. They don't know who Fannie Lou Hamer is. And he said, that it's not his quote, an author used the word menticide to mean the taking away of black people's historical understanding of what happened to them. And by destroying a people's history, it becomes a mental destruction of a people. Because the people without their understanding of their history are lost. And a lot of these young kids today of all races are lost. So we have been developing this revolutionary history project to train young people to read history, to study history, and among the 37 other projects I'm trying to run, I really want to try to build that up. So the question I would say is this. Um, I put the burden almost overwhelmingly on the system because if you look at a teacher like Judy Ansel, if you could have more people studying with her, all the change that can happen, but look at all the progressive teachers who have even been purged from the universities. In other words, they, it's not just that they're not studying, it's that from the high schools to the colleges, they have pushed out black and Latino and women's studies, made them into corporate black, corporate women, corporate Latino. They have run a counterinsurgency against the universities of getting rid of some of the best teachers. So it's a real uphill battle, but I read every night. I love reading history. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. I think we need to get more books, and funny you should mention that. There's a, <laughs> book here called, uh, what's it called, Playbook for Progressives, that's a good way to address the very problem that you addressed, my friend. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm a retired city bus driver, 
And congratulations. Um, thank you. <laughs> and anyway, um, they've taken money the last two years from the buses for the streetcar that they're right, building right. without a vote. Right. We voted <coughs> the money for the buses, not the streetcar. And they also want to run the streetcar down the, the white lane. And the people that need the bus on the east side are, are you know, they're going to be taking money from them. And they had a express route that went down Main Street, where white folks live, and then Truce, the dividing line. And they used money from the feds. Now they're going to put one on Prospect, which is in the black neighborhood, and they want a tax. They want to raise, uh, they want to charge the taxpayers money. When they had taken that money from the feds, it, and they're going to direct it to the streetcar. I totally, stay, stay there for a second. Oh, you, you just said I'll, I'll respond to your, your point. It's very important what she said. I don't know if you follow this bouncing ball. Um, word for word, what you said is happening in every city in the United States. So let me give you an example. In Los Angeles, when they started building rail, they had cost overruns for rail. Where did they find the money? They started stealing from the bus system. First, they stole bus, what's called capital, which means they didn't buy new buses that they were supposed to buy because they wanted money uh, to build this rail line. But then they ran out of money, so they started stealing from our fares. And they raised the bus fare and eliminated the monthly bus pass altogether, which meant that families in Los Angeles back then, who were making $14,000 a year, were going to have to pay $1.35 per ride. And some of those families were taking 100 rides per month. So the, the $48 bus pass was going to become the $140 bus pass, right? <clears throat> so I have to say the truth. I've been trained in the civil rights movement. I felt that this was uh, an example of separate but equal of, because the bus riders were more black and Latino. And I dreamed up a court case to sue the Los Angeles MTA in violating Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which is government cannot use money in a racially discriminatory manner. I wrote up the case and I floated it out to three different firms. And thank God, Bill Lan Lee and Connie Rice of the uh, NACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund read it and said, we got a case. And just, if you could just take another minute, uh, this is how they work. Bill says, well, I read your case. What would be the MTA's rebuttal? And I won't go through it, but I rebutted it from the point I was, I gave the MTA's line. Then he says, how would you rebut the MTA's rebuttal? I rebutted the MTA's rebuttal. He says, all right, we got a case. Come on over here. Within 14 days, we had to go into court to stop the fare increase. We went in and got a temporary restraining order against the fare increase because Connie Rice said to the judge, Your Honor, the MTA is balancing its budget on the backs of bus riders, is balancing its budget by having rail cost overruns and then using public funds that should be used for riders to raise the, the fare. So funny, we must live in the same country. Right? And also, the point they want saying, to go non-union with the streetcar. That's right. So I think what we want to do, in my opinion, and we'll hear what the brother thinks back there, but I think focusing on um, the bus system and focusing on union jobs together is the best combination of environment and civil rights and labor rights. That would be my preliminary sense of coming to Kansas City, is, is to do that and to oppose the, the, this new uh, rail project. Yes. I love your slogan, fight for the soul of the cities. And um, there are hundreds of thousands of us in America who are in essence fighting for the soul of America. Right. We're seeking to amend the US Constitution to establish that only Human beings are persons with constitutional rights, right. and the political money is not 
free speech so it can be regulated in the political process. I'm interested in your thoughts about that kind of fight and how we can work more effectively at organizing at that sort of um, grand scheme. Um, this is fun, I have to say. Did, did you all come from heaven? Because me and Judy have been in hell a couple of times. So <laughs> we're, uh, are you all from Central Casting or something? We really appreciate it. Uh, no, really, the thought, uh, all right, let me tell you a couple of thoughts I have on this. The first thing is that um, in organizing, one of the things you have to do uh, is demonize the enemy because they are demons. That is to say, they demonize us, right? They have all these slurs against, racial slurs against us and political slurs. So in Los Angeles, we've called the other side the privatizing, polluting, policing class. The soulless privatizers, the soulless policers, the soulless polluters. We've got a lot of soul. So first of all, we grabbed it on them. So they're in big trouble now because they got no soul and they know it. So I like the idea of what you're doing. I want to tell you some of my um, concerns about the campaign, but let me start with the positive. I don't think this is ever going to pass until, just hear me out, until a whole lot of other changes take place. But I think the ideological impact of what you're doing is so important. Because like this brother said, saying to somebody, do you think a corporation is a person? Do you think a corporation has free speech rights? that they can have billions of dollars to destroy our union because it's their speech, that's not speech, and, and a corporation is not a person, that becomes the question. Because in the person's mind, well, wait, and you know what a lot of them are going to say? Well, someday I may grow up and be a corporation. So I may want that right. I mean, because capitalism is so brilliant. You know, we're all, uh, uh, a lot of the workers, when we try to, uh, keep the GM Van Nuys open, I, I said they all suffer from the 7-Eleven complex, which is, well, if we stand up to GM and tell them what to do, what if I open up a 7-Eleven? Are you going to tell me what to do? I said, dude, you got carpal tunnel syndrome, you're 58 years old, you have sciatica, you got no money, you open up nothing, and you're dreaming of nothing, and you still want to protect General Motors from your hypothetical 7-Eleven. What are you smoking? You know? And, and fight the death tax. What? Yeah. And he said that's a good, he actually said that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> see, in, in unions, you can talk like that. See, it's like you don't have to. So, but we call it, I mean, America is brilliant because people say, well, I'm not rich, but I want the right to be rich. And you say, yeah, but the right to be rich is to take away other, I'm not against, seriously, a certain accumulation of wealth, but not to how the society allows wealth to be accumulated. It has to be restricted. It has to be socialized. And there still can be markets. There still can be the possibility of um, uneven wages, but not a thousand to one, not where some people are starving to death. There's got to be a floor first. And after the floor, we can debate the ceiling. Right? But all of us must put enough money in that all of us have housing, all of us have food, all of us have medical care, all of us have no f economic fear. And then if there's somebody who wants to buy more toys, that's fine with me. But back to your point, is I think trying to get a constitutional amendment, what I'm concerned about is that a lot of white people who are really interested in this issue, when I tell them about there's a lot of kids in prison, it doesn't, the light bulb doesn't go off. When I talk to them about immigrants, the light bulb doesn't go off. They're fixated on this issue about that court case. And I think, just like I'm critical of Occupy, for being so economically oriented, instead of, I mean, here's young kids, and yet they were focusing a lot on the 1% and the 99%, but they weren't focusing enough on a social justice agenda. So what I would say to you is this. Yes, it's very good what you're doing. I mean that. Continue what you're doing. But raise the challenge to some of the people you're working with that this cannot be the sole issue because it's excluding a lot of social justice questions from the white middle class that I think is a little bit obsessing on this thing. Actually, move to amend, which is the organization. 
has two things. One of them is amending the Constitution in the way that I said, and the other is building a real grassroots democracy in the whole effort to get enough masses of people to fight for this. And absolutely it is for anti-oppression and for having people from all communities really participate in the fight for democracy and then be able to really be a part of democracy when we ever achieve it in the United States. Thanks a lot. Hey, I have a question. What, my favorite thing to do is sign books. C can we move to signing books? Yeah. You know? Because that way we can go out, we can talk informally, we can still keep the conversation going, but um, I hope you, you do get books, and, and I'm serious. Uh, think about getting some books in the hands of, of people, and also um, Ashley has a petition that she's working on to extend voting rights of vote, the vote beyond the actual day of the election. So buy a book, sign a petition, give us some money, and come and talk to us. <laughs>